Masha, welcome to the show. And Scott, welcome back to the show. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having us back. Yeah, thanks. Great to be on. Happy 2020, guys. Last time we had you on, I believe, was the end of 20... Wait, did I say happy 2022? Yeah. My God, what year is it? <laughs> I was going to say, last time I had you on was 2020. Um, and congrats, guys. You guys have been uh, really setting the world on fire. Um, a big new funding round. Uh, give us the update on Masterworks. What have you guys been up to um, hard at work the past uh, past year? Yeah, I mean, the past year, it feels like uh, feels like ancient history thinking about a year ago. But, um, you know, the business has changed dramatically. So we're we're raising about $45 million a month now. Um, we have 320,000 investors signed up on the platform. Uh, Masha and her team have quickly become the largest buyer in the art market. Um, so yeah, I mean, a, a year feels like feels like a decade at this point. The business has, has changed a lot. As you mentioned, we've raised $110 million at a valuation north of a billion. So, um, you know, the business just continues to grow super rapidly. What do you, what are you spending all that money on? Is that uh, sort of like a, a war chest to buy art? Is to hire people? Is to open galleries? What are you guys doing? You know, it's really it's really all the above. So we're hiring twenty to thirty people a month now. Um, we're building out lots of functions that didn't didn't exist previously, like like research, uh, data analytics. Uh, our sales and marketing teams are growing quickly. Uh, we're using, you know, part of our, our process of taking a painting public is we buy the painting uh, before we file it with the SEC. So there's there's a working capital need. But yeah, it's just it's it's really growth across the board. Um, I'm, and I'm sure you uh, get uh, amused and ignore all the Meb's crazy brainstorm ideas I send you every like three months. And, and listeners, as you know, I know nothing about art. Um, every three months, I'll like email Scott some crazy idea and he, and he humors me and at least writes back. So we'll, we'll touch on a few of those today. Um, what does that mean, by the way, to be the largest buyer in the art, mar art market? You're now the whale. You're now the BSD, as the finance people would, would call you guys. Um, does that create some problems for you guys? Uh, you know, I know art is a big stinking asset class, probably north of a trill. Is that right? Maybe a couple trillion. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a we have one and a half trillion dollar asset class, roughly 60 billion in art sales every year. Um, so, you know, this year we'll buy upwards of a billion dollars in art. So we're clearly, clearly the largest, largest player at this point. So I, I know you guys um, do you like, does this create benefits or like, does it create like some real growing pain struggles? I mean, like, here's what I'm thinking of is like, I was, I was dying laughing the other day when. Um, there was the Dow that was trying to buy the constitution and they raised whatever it was like $30 million, literally yeah. telegraphing to the entire world, how much capital they have to spend on it. And then of course, um, the Darth Vader of the, the last few years, Ken Griffin comes in and is like, you know what, I'll pay one more dollar than whatever these guys bid. Um, yeah. does this create some benefits size or is it actually a hindrance? Talk, talk to me a little bit about that. I think the number one thing that you have to understand about the art market is that, that unlike most asset classes that you're mentioning of, you know, that would compete in size is that it's focused largely on personal relationships. So really for us being uh, now the number one go-to for a lot of dealers, a lot of, um, you know, private sellers, it's a huge, huge advantage. And so we actually probably one of the biggest advantages that we have is an information advantage. And so in terms of, for example, pricing the constitution with the Dow didn't have that we have are a bunch of data points on what potentially other comparable constitutions have sold for just to put this in kind of, you know, familiar language. And so I think for us, as we scale, we really look forward to kind of growing the number of relationships that we have. And so the more kind of name visibility and more introductions that we can get, you know, across uh, different types of sellers actually creates a really big benefit to us and the business. So today we're really focused on 55 artist markets. So these are these are blue chip name artists like, you know, everyone from Picasso to Basquiat on down to more important living artists like Cecily Brown, um, etc. And out of those 55 artist markets, I think Mosh's team now has seen more than 12 or 13 billion dollars in work. Um, so we're, st we're still buying two or three percent of what we see, but the information advantage of having all of the that that private offer data is becoming pretty, pretty big. 
-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to think in my head, like in, in what scenario, I, I know a lot of y'all's transactions go, what's, I don't know if the right word is secondary, but not necessarily at auction, right? Like where you reach out to someone. Um, what scenario is that person uh, willing to sell it to you guys as opposed to an auction? So when we're talking about uh, buying in the art market, you touched on this a little bit, but there are two types of, well, I would say there are two broadly speaking types of transactions uh private and auction and so the private sales are you know the advantage that you have is that nobody knows the price that you pay um and you are potentially able to make a greater return because nobody is um actually using your auction price to benchmark it um the the tough thing about private sales is that it can take a, mu a much longer time to clear so people actually usually ask for higher prices privately not that necessarily the works actually sell or clear for that amount whereas at auction um, you see a lot of works come up at the same time uh you know they're usually geographically centered and around a certain month so for example in new york uh, november and may you have all the high value works coming in at a certain time and so you have this one event where you have a bunch of works sell at once and so what we see a lot of times with auction is that um you can you know, you see sometimes uh, competitive bidding, sometimes works that we expect to sell for more money, you know, we end up buying for less than what we saw it for privately, you know, sometimes by a factor of two. And so it's auction is just more unpredictable, whereas private, it's, it's nice to have the private price and the private sales transaction for somebody selling. I think they factor all of that in. If they feel that, you know, personally, that it's the right time to send a certain artist, uh, artist's work to auction, they might gamble on the result versus, you know, bring, buying something privately is everybody knows what, what they're getting at the end. Yeah, I think, I think at the end of the day, look, I mean, if we pay more for a painting, 99% of collectors will, will sell it to us. And they're, they're dealing really with the end buyer, whereas there's, there's a lot of art world intermediaries that try to take things on like consignment, promise to sell things, they oftentimes don't deliver. So I think, I think just the fact that they know who the buyer is and, and you know, as, as you mentioned, we're paying a higher price net of net of transaction fees is is most mostly compelling you know there's there's a couple of these not even multi-decade multi-century old companies and auction houses that go back a really long way what yeah. what's the relationship you guys have with them on one hand i would think they love you because you're increasing hundreds of thousands of new investors interested in the art space increasing awareness new dollars in transactions on the other hand, you very much have the potential to totally disrupt their business model. Um, what's what's the yeah. story? You guys go out for a glass of wine. Are they uh, they they pretty stoked on you, or is it complicated? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think I think at the end of the day, being the biggest buyer, we do a ton of business with the auction houses. Um, the reality is, we we don't we've strategically made a decision not to really build out a retail business dealing with thousands of in collectors to buy paintings. So I think we we view that, you know, long term we'll still be working with with intermediaries. We, we never want to be in the business of taking collectors around to art fairs and helping them, you know, think about different artists to buy and, you know, eventually buying buying an individual painting. It's it's a lot of work that, you know, the auction houses staff thousands of people to do that. So I, I don't think that ever really becomes our, our core competency. Yeah, and, and to add to Scott's point, I think we touched on how selective we are about what we buy. So whereas the auction houses, if you bring them something that's you know not on this list of 55 artists, they have somebody else to sell this to. We just, you know, we don't have those outlets and we're really just focused on a select group of artists. There's so many things we're gonna talk about today, but one is we, we should certainly walk forward from when we last chatted uh, last time. And, um, you know, we were in the midst of a pandemic, which, uh, you know, as, as we sit here today, literally, I think I have it. My son has it, we're all fine. Um, but if I sound a little uh, hoarse, listeners know why. Um, but the, the flavor of, um, what the world looked like now versus you know a year ago it's a little bit different um what what's the last year been like obviously um you know things have continued uh in in your world um despite not as much in-person events and, and, and i'd love to what, what was the significance of november and may are those actual like gatherings or people just happen to transact during those periods and, and what's what's the last year been like 
Yeah, I mean, look, I think from a retail investing perspective, we've seen tons of tailwinds, right? You, you know, the whole kind of Robin Hood investing at home dynamic has been big for us. It's been been big for for a lot of other platforms. Um, I think throughout the pandemic, we've we've shifted much more towards a private buying strategy with auctions recently recently opening up towards the end of last year. Um, and from an art market perspective, I mean, we we always had this. I guess hypothesis. We published a lot of research on how art prices were, were non-correlated, meaning they don't move in the same pattern that public equities move in, um, and they're correlated to growth in the top one percent on a global basis. So the wealthier people get, the more art prices go up, and it's always you know it's always fun to publish this this data, and then you have a real world event which kind of uh, tests it. So that's that's what what COVID did, and I think what we've seen, and Masha can talk about the the sales in November, but you know, we, we've seen our prices continue to grow rapidly at the beginning of the pandemic all the way through the end of the pandemic. And for, for better or for worse, I think that's probably because the top 1%, you know, really wasn't wasn't hurt with the pandemic, arguably benefited. So um, that really supports a lot of the, the research that we did historically. I mean, to Scott's point there, I think in terms of the art market and where it was, you know, a year ago, two years ago versus now, is that there's just a lot more adaptability in terms of how people communicate online and what's made available by the auction houses for somebody that's just clicking through their website, but it's not, you know, an astronomical jump. It's it still involves, you know, the auctions that we touched on. They happen in New York in May and November. Those are the spring auctions. And then in London in uh, March and June and then October. And then in Hong Kong, also kind of in the spring and the fall. And so with these sales happening, people have a time to go see the works in person for the auction works in person, but then the auction houses worked around to create a hybrid in person online experience and so now they actually started letting people attend auctions again in person. Uh, last season which previously you know for the last year and a half they hadn't but it's not a tremendous shift in how people are buying because if you actually go and sit in the auction room, you notice that most people are bidding or bidding with an auction specialist on the phone and the auction specialist is raising their hand on behalf of this client who's on the other line versus you know it was maybe 10 years ago that people were really actively bidding in the room the trend to people bidding you know via phone has actually started long before pandemic so i don't think the shift is seismic in that regard and your actual experience of being in an auction yeah, so, it is interesting. Like, I, I do think that we're seeing, though, more. We, we had this uh, senior executive for one of the auction houses here the other day, and he was talking about how, you know, their belief is that people are becoming more and more comfortable buying $10 million paintings online without actually <clears throat> without actually seeing them. So I think that's a, that's a new trend that's interesting, right? Like, historically, we've never really seen multi-million dollar transactions happening without people standing in front of a painting. So I, I, I think that's an interesting shift in the market. Yeah. Or they might send someone to go view it on their behalf or do it all through, you know, pictures, video, et cetera. But exactly, just God's point, the picture doesn't need to travel to where the client is. Yeah, I remember I remember tweeting at some point last year, there was some statistic that um, <clears throat> that was same thing with people buying houses. Um, that and, and I was like, I can't believe all these people would buy this huge, uh, purchase without ever visiting the house and then like my entire replies was like, people have been like i totally did that and i was like what that's crazy <laughs> you know um but you know the world yeah. the world's different right like it things are changing um i'm going to say one more kind of big shift of the past year uh has been and continues to be inflation you know this is something that whether you think it's short term or long term or what it's clearly here now um what are the sort of knock-on effects for you guys are uh, is it um is it something you see as both a headwind tailwind do you see it uh you know increase interest like what, what's the what's the general impact this has had or is having um on your world yeah i mean look we hear it every day like we we have a thousand phone calls a day with investors now onboarding them into the platform and in, inflation is probably the most common theme I think from from a research perspective, in order in order to be fair to the topic, we we don't entirely have sufficient data going back in the art market um, to the 70s and 80s, which which would be relevant for the 
the inflation analysis. I think we think of art as an inflation neutral asset at worst and maybe an inflation hedge at best. Um, obviously, physical objects, tangible objects are, are kind of thought real assets to be inflation hedges generally. Um, but we, you know, we don't at this point, we don't have, I, I guess, enough data to really conclude that it's an inflation, an inflation hedge. Yeah, my, my expectation is that it will be. I mean, I, I kind of put all real assets and uh, collectibles into that category. You know, they obviously go through their own, um, go along to their own song based on what's going on with the dynamics yeah. of the asset class. But but my expectation is they, they would, they would be. The one, I'd say the one real advantage that art has over a hard asset like real estate is that you have to remember that if we're, you know, looking at an international artist that's of interest, that artist might be, you know, interesting and in being acquired to people in Asia, in Europe, in the US. So an inflationary dynamic in one country in the US is admittedly dominant in one of the dominant countries in collecting um, won't necessarily affect a certain artist's market. So I don't know what do you Yeah, what I mean one of, one of the things we always say is like which is reality, right? Like remember that you can buy a painting in New York and you can put it on a plane and you can sell it in Hong Kong. So it's almost this this separate currency on its own that that kind of just you know operates around the globe. I mean Masha's team you're doing deals all the time now outside of the US. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we really, you know, we 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 kind of view it as this global global asset class that's that's country independent you guys got a uh soho showroom yet <laughs> we uh we, that that you know it's funny that so we i think that was pre-covid right we that had, was definitely pre-covid we set up the gallery this gallery in soho pre-covid COVID happened we never really got a lot of traction and the business has just grown so much during COVID. as i you know as i mentioned we're onboarding over a thousand investors a day now via phone calls. So the online presence has just outpaced um, kind of the retail presence. So we really, really and focused we, on and that. And when we had it, very few people stopped by, which was a shame. Yeah. Um, so it's it's kind of interesting. I think it just speaks to kind of the nature of investing, especially in something like this. Well, here's what you do. You call it the museum, Massworks Museum. You're only allowed in if you own part of a painting. But the upside is you can buy a fraction at the door so it's both a client acquisition tool uh and so you can say look you can buy 20 bucks of whatever painting it is um i'm full of these terrible ideas masha you're you're near new with, day, with so our I, minimums that's going to be the most expensive think, museum <laughs> ticket on the go. planet we're going to get roasted well, that's fine i, I, um, I think i think, I think that meb should direct all of his ideas to you in the future <laughs> yeah. i think we'll be able to yeah we'll find we'll find one that definitely works well, one of the areas, um, and this is a topic that, that I find um, fascinating, and um, you guys have talked about NFTs. Um, the concept that I was pestering Scott about, I said, you know, I say I own a handful of Masterworks paintings, and um, one of the problems that I would like to have solved is... Um, you know, I, I want to hang a version on my wall. I know it's not the real thing. I don't care. Um, I was like, you guys need to have a, an online store that lets you buy, I mean, posters, but but prints or whatever of the paintings that you have an ownership in. And so um, one of the big things we're learning from NFTs is, you know, a lot of people buy are buying them for signaling, you know, and status where um, if I could have uh, a replica of the Basquiat or whatever in my house and be like, you know what? I own that painting, a very small pixel portion of that little, that little red uh, paint stroke in the bottom right corner. That's how much I own. However, I own it. I would love to hang it. You guys ever going to open an online store? We, we can get some, uh, some, some swag or uh, are there complications to that? Yeah, I mean, we it's it's been on our product roadmap. I think I, I think I mentioned this to you. We we like the idea. Um, it hasn't it hasn't hit the priority list yet, but I mean that's that's something that that hopefully we can get to later this year. Um, I mean, we get the request all the time. I think it's a pretty pretty common request from investors. Yeah. Um, there's been no mention of NFTs yet in the show, other than than my brief reference. Uh, we talked about it a little bit on the last podcast. What what what's your general mind space um, sort of uh, thinking there? Are you guys spending any time 
noodling on that topic. Uh, I imagine you get a lot of questions about it. How, how are you thinking about it? Yeah, I, so, I, so I guess when we think about it, and, and remember, <clears throat> when, when, when we think about this from a Masterworks perspective, we have thousands of investors who invest from retirement accounts. We have people who are, um, are allocating art as a, as a serious part of their portfolio. We don't view NFTs today as a strategic asset class. And when we when we think about the definition of a strategic asset class, it's really something that outperforms inflation and is non-correlated. And I and I think if you go through that analysis and you think of, you know, does do NFTs today outperform inflation? It, there's such a short period of time, right? We had we had skyrocketing NFT prices, we had a collapse in prices, we had them skyrocket again. It's hard to conclude that that you know they're they're moving up in a predictable uh way over time i think they're they're super speculative right now and then relative to correlation you know i think this is changing a little bit but nfts were highly correlated to ethereum which is highly correlated to bitcoin just highly correlated to public equities so we we struggle with thinking about nfts as part of an investment portfolio um, you know, it doesn't mean that buying an NFT today couldn't couldn't be a great investment and may may be one. But um, in terms of predictable returns, it, it, you know, it certainly certainly isn't predictable at this point. All right, let's talk about some paintings. Um, how many of you guys uh, uh, different offerings have you guys done thus far? So we've acquired signed paperwork for 100 paintings. We haven't launched each one of those on the platform. Um, so we've launched what, maybe 70 ish now? I think it's like 90. I think it's like 90. 90. What's, what's the frequency? I just know like, how much we buy. <laughs> yeah. And then the rest of it, I let Scott worry about. Yeah. What, uh, what's the frequency? Like one a week, one a month? It's one, one every five and a half days now. Um, so these are paying somewhere between one and one and $20 million each. I think the average price point now is about five, five to $6 million. Um, so we're launching them pretty, pretty frequently. Uh, I think by the end of end of this year, we're, we're projecting that we'll be launching almost one a day. Mm. Um, so it's certainly the cadence is really, really picked up. Um, so let's hear about it. Uh, I, I, like I said, I have a few, um, talk a little bit and Masha, you can chime in particularly here since, uh, you, you're the, you're the, you're the, um, you're, you're the big buyer the hammer um the axe that's I, that's the word i was thinking of i was like market making i couldn't remember the name for a stock uh going back to the old days of the market maker the axe all right um talk to me about buying and selling these paintings what's what's involved um do you have to wear disguises or is it uh is it helpful to be <laughs> i known don't as... go in in like a mustache and bowler hat mm -hmm. that's not my mo i think i you know there are some people who are like collectors who are really well known that people fall around art fairs like try and figure out what they're buying. Um, the reality is that, you know, the way that most of these transactions happen these days is that we are, you know, the team as a whole, the acquisitions team as a whole is in market speaking to um, dealers, auction houses, collectors, uh, really intermediaries every single day. We have, you know, we spend hours on the phone and then they will send us works that they believe fit our, uh, you know, what we're looking for. And so, you know, there's no disguise involved because our first exposure to these works is usually via text or via PDF. And then if we think that there's a work that we believe uh, could be interesting to masterworks, especially if this is an inter intermediary we've worked with frequently, that deal could happen in 24 hours if we get there on price and we get there on payment terms. And so, you know, we can have, uh, or we can have a much more prolonged negotiation with, you know, a brand new seller to the company. And so once that painting is acquired, once we decide that, you know, we like this painting, we go see it, we inspect the physical condition. Um, we're sure that all the due, dil due diligence has been performed um, adequately. We've finished our research and we sign the paperwork and then we begin the SEC filing process. And so I made that sound much more simple than it actually is because, you know, the hard part, as we'd said earlier, is our uh, we acquire about two now two to three percent of what we see and so the hard part is really finding that those three out of a hundred paintings that we want to own what, what's so the what's the main what's the main disqualifier that kicks the painting out is it price is it just not fit your general um sort of wheelhouse what is it 
So the number one thing we look for is, is this an artist that we believe in? And so that is something that we work on and get a lot of input in from the research team on, on whether or not this is an artist that uh, is right for mass works and for investment. And then when we actually go in market to look for works by those artists, we want examples that are super representative uh, by, by that person. And so what's an artist, uh, for example, that you've invested in with us or Perhaps, you know, if that touches on we got uh, artists that you like. We'll Basquiat. Yeah. Herring. Um, uh, what else? We can start with those. How about how about Basquiat? Yeah. Um, I'll speak a little bit to Basquiat. So he really, you know, his breakout year is seen as 82. Prior to that, he was doing a lot of graffiti in Soho. We actually from time to time do see kind of like graffiti works come up on non-traditional surfaces. So when I'm looking for a Basquiat, I'm looking for something that looks and feels like, you know, 1982 and beyond work. So that when you're looking at this work, you think of it as, you know, a successful uh, commercial example by the artist. So, you know, something that's like a, you know, pithy same quo, which was his uh, graffiti moniker for from his uh, early days in Soho. While that could be interesting to a collector who just really loves the idea of Basquiat as a street artist, for Masterworks, we're focused on works that will continue to have liquidity. Um, and so part of that is finding the works that are really representative of the best qualities of an artist. So they have potentially the crown that he's famous for. Um, they have, you know, like specific types of figures, specific ways that it's drawn, specific colors. And so that's what we really look for. And the one thing I would say that's super hard about Marsha's job, but she does very well, is like dealing with all of these art world intermediaries. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think of like the right analogy, but it's like dealing with, I think we have 1400 intermediaries who work with them. Yeah. So like dealing with like, you know, like 1400 very high end car dealerships. Like <laughs> yeah. it's, you know, yeah. it's, 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 uh, there are a lot and it's like less objective than that in a way because, you know, somebody selling a painting might have, might know the artist or might have known the artist when they were alive or been one of the people first people to show the artist so you'll often talk to people who, who have a very personal connection to the work they're selling and so we like to make all our decisions based on uh our you know private and public market intelligence etc you know sometimes people are very emotional um about about the deal and so you know, getting those across the line. Is probably well, I mean, if ever there's an asset class that would elicit emotions, it's art, right? Like that's the, the, the you know, so much of the uh, tangible value is, is what people are willing to pay. You know, these things, um, for the most part, aren't cash flowing like a traditional business. And so a lot of the value is, is wrapped up in that. And so um, maybe expand on that a little bit. The you know, one of the biggest selling points for you guys what attracted me to your process in the early days is I'm a quant. So um, the art world, uh, historically, a very um, just scattered, uh, you know, insiders network of uh, transparency and prices. And, you know, you guys have now built this just monster, uh, in a good way, uh, database and history of transactions. And to me, there's a very real edge in, in owning and having that. Um, so how much of it ends up being sort of this objective, uh, you know, screens and criteria versus some of the subjectivity on, on you know, how, how this plays out? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. We actually just released a, a research piece on, on data in the art market compared to, to other asset classes. And I think I think a lot of people just misunderstand that that there's a huge data set um, to, to rely on for understanding returns in the art market because half of the market trades at public auction. So you have public auction data that goes back literally a century, like Sotheby's is 275 years old. I think Christie's is 250 years old. 253 now. So, they celebrated so you, 250 the year I left, which is the only reason I know. Yeah, I mean, Sotheby's was the oldest company on the New York Stock Exchange up until it going private recently. So you, you, you have auction data going back, you know, decades, theoretically centuries. And that's a really good data set to understand how has how the art market performed. Um, so, you know, our, our view is that there's, there's tons of data on the art market to reliably understand appreciation rate by segment, how artist markets are acceleration, uh, accelerating how the asset class is correlated to other asset classes. It, it just really hasn't been done before, right? We're really the first firm to take that data, assemble it, and, and use it in a way 
um, that would be similar to traditional asset classes. And I think, you know, to piggyback off what Scott said, I think part of that is because until maybe like 20 years ago, uh, the auctions were really only place dealers went and then dealers would buy that art. You almost think of it as like a wholesale and then they would sell it on to collectors. I think that's like a overgeneralization, but that's primarily how it worked. And then you wouldn't really have people looking at prices, analyzing the data. Um, and then now you have a few businesses that have just been built on, I guess, hoarding the data, so to speak, um, where you have a couple price databases, um, but nobody, I mean, it's a huge lift to build out the kind of research that Masterworks has done to actually analyze the returns because the price databases are really just focused on snapshots of what did this sell for kind of most recently or what's the price history here? Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> I've been collecting for about 20 years now. And I, one of the things I think is really interesting is to go back and think about the art market in the 90s versus the 2000s. And the key the key change in the art market, I think, really happened when, when a company called Artnet um, started publishing auction results via a website so that collectors could access the data and understand what prices things were actually selling for at auction. Um, prior to that, you, you would really rely on dealers or other people in, in the art market to say how much things were worth. You would hire appraisers to appraise things. And that data was never that reliable because it was really just based on, based on their experiences. So the internet really opened up a whole new data set for, for people to begin analyzing on, on the market overall. Um. I remember talking about we've we've done some uh, some other modern fractionalization podcasts. One is on a topic near and dear to our heart, farming, and and I remember um, chatting with the founder CEO, and he's like, you know, our typical investor profile is this, but we straight up have a few people that own like fifty farms now. You know, where you have this just long tail investor. So of these three hundred thousand people, what's kind of the the um, typical profile? Uh, you know, I have my guesses, but also, is there anyone who was on there who's like, you know what, I'm going to buy every painting, no matter what, um, I'm just going to load the boat on, I'm all in on Masterworks. I'm just like a, it's like a robo advisor subscription service where they're just uh, diversifying all the way across. Um, what's, uh, what's, what's the answer to both? What's your typical investor? And do you got any, uh, um, anybody with 50 plus? I mean, we, 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 we definitely don't. I, I want to figure out who that farm guy is and go after yeah, him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, but this we, concept of, you know, diversification, if you do, if you do it for sheer, you know, enjoyment, that's one thing. If, if you do it where you're actually trying to build a diversified portfolio, you know, um, the more the better, right? I mean, I, you probably need at least 10 of anything uh, to capture sort of what's going on so um yeah it's it's interesting in, in our we, we've done that research and we've concluded that eight paintings is kind of sufficient diversification um but eight yeah artists close, or eight paintings eight, eight artists yeah eight sorry artists. Eight, eight artist markets is sufficient sufficient diversification um you know look our our average investor has grown dramatically so i think when when we spoke last it was probably you know, we're probably seeing people invest in the single thousands of dollars on average. Now, our average investor is investing somewhere between thirty and forty thousand over their lifetime. Yeah. You know, I would say it's it's people that have portfolio sizes above five hundred thousand um, dollars. So the the size of investor has has really grown. Now that that doesn't mean that we don't we don't serve smaller investors. We we do, and we fundamentally believe in that since these are these are retail offerings. Um, but yeah, I mean, we we don't have we don't have whales, right? Like our our biggest investor, I think, is is about a million or just over a million dollars, and that's incredibly rare for us. So we, you know, we don't. I would. That's uh, we, that we, we long don't. tail where they're investing like twenty k per offering and a hundred k if they really like it, and that's super rare. Yeah. I also did see an account the other day. You're gonna love this. Every single painting we've ever launched, twenty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> see, there you go. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, this is somebody who probably like signed up for us when we first, when the company was first launched, like yeah. got grandfathered in like a long, what, long time ago. What, what is the, what's the minimum now? You know, it, it, so we, we have phone calls with every single investor now that we onboard and we run them through suitability. So we, the, the minimums are technically uh, 10, 10 or $15,000, but we lower them based on suitability. So if that's too high for someone based on their portfolio, the, the team will, will, will drop them. 
You mean 10, 10 for portfolio or 10 per painting? 10 per painting. 10 per painting. Um, yeah. And there was $20 in the beginning. That's amazing. It was, it was no, no, no minimum in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. If you go uh, find, there's like an old, like CNN style article. Uh, do you guys uh, sync up with any of these um, IRA accounts? Uh, are you able to put these in tax deferred or no? Yeah, so we we support Alto IRA, um, which which has been pretty pretty popular. Um, yeah, but they're they're really the only ones that we support right now. Well, good. That's a podcast alum. We've had them on the on the show a few times. Uh, so a shout out to those guys. Um, I, I want to keep talking about the the buying and selling, but this is this is a typical Meb conversation because I, I I have all these ideas I want to talk about. One being. Um, I'm a cheap bastard. And so I love the concept of like getting something on the, on the, on the, um, getting a deal on something. You guys got a secondary marketplace. Uh, talk to me. What's the story there? Um, I see some condos, some Monet's on here, some Banksy's. Uh, how does, how does the secondary marketplace work? Yeah, the secondary markets, uh, just think of it as a, you know, as a traditional <laughs> secondary market for any asset class. So after an investor invests, they can, Put a sell order on the secondary market, and then people can, um, um, you know, can purchase those shares. Uh, I think you're right, though. I mean, I, I do think there there are interesting deals in the secondary market. Like we we see that in particular. I think when artist markets change pretty rapidly, like over the last um, year, I, I, I guess probably the last year, we've seen Banksy's market dramatically accelerate. Maybe prices go up as much as 100. Uh, percent Some of the you know some of the secondary market tends to tends to lag behind that. So I do think there's there's interesting deals there. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I think Bank, Banksy is just such an idiosyncratic example because people who invest in Masterworks really love him in general. So I would say his prices have sometimes been, like before there was that big jump yeah, in right. his market, sometimes you saw the opposite. You saw the secondary market be ahead of, um, kind of on one of the uh, past offerings, you saw the secondary market ahead of where, where his prices were. Dude, he's like yeah. shares, I'm looking at this, he's like shares of Tesla. This thing trades like every day. Uh, this is all over the place. People you probably got some, yeah, yeah, I like we, it. We had a, uh, we just had our fast, our, our, I guess most valuable painting sell out in the fastest amount of time. It was the uh, the Banksy uh, exit shop. shop. Yes. Which is Gift the shop. same uh, title as the painting he won an, an Academy Award nomination for. It was in his Banksy versus Bristol show, so. That's right. I, I tried to get into that one, and you guys, uh, you guys, uh, shut it down too quick. Um, yeah, we didn't it shut was... it down. It, it was the demand shut it. Well, down. Well, that's what I mean. Is is there like a? Is there? Do you guys have like a auto subscription at all? Like where I'm like, look, I want to invest in basically yeah, every paint. We, we don't today. Disallowed. Um, yeah, we don't today. It's a really hard regulatory problem because we, since these are public offerings, you have to sign every subscription agreement. So there's really no way around that that confirmation. Um, but yeah, it was it was cool to see that Banksy painting. There was a seven million dollar seven million dollar offering. Yeah, sold down in a couple hours. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I've actually I don't think I've ever heard of anyone doing straight up phone based um, onboarding. Uh, what was the decision there? I mean, that, that's something that seems um, thoughtful and you know going the extra mile compared to I, I don't think that's probably required by the SEC. Um, what, what was the decision to do that? And, you know, how much work is that? And, 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 and how often do you actually kick people out versus they kind of like opt out or, or self-select out? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a ton of work. I mean, we, we have, uh, you know, 40, 40 licensed reps um, who are licensed by FINRA to, to talk about how people are investing today, um, what their risk tolerance is, how they think about diversification, um, you know, how, what their horizon is for investing. So we run every investor through suitability. We talk about the asset class at length. We talk about individual artist markets. I, I think for us, you know, we, we've just always found it to be more effective, maybe because people don't know how to think about art as an asset class. There's really no pre-existing intent to invest in art. So we're educating people for the first time. I think that's that's I mean our assumption is that's different than things like real estate where people kind of come to a lot of these platforms already knowing something about real estate um, and wanting to allocate to it. 
Yeah. I mean, there, it's, it's funny because it, it's an asset class that certainly has a familiarity from people loving and understanding art, but it's one of the rare asset classes where people, the, like the percentages of familiarity and, and like, you know, knowing it versus actual tangible ownership, um, it's probably the biggest disconnect I can think of. I mean, farmland is, is one that, you know, I put in that same category and, and two of the biggest opportunities that, you know, that we talk about, um, you know, versus a lot of other things are easily transactable. Um, talk to me some feedback from having these thousands of conversations and now up to 300,000 investors. What, what are some of the takeaways? Um, I imagine, you know, most everyone comes to this interested in Picasso, and some other things, but like, are there any surprises or uh, things where you're like, well, you know, now having done all these conversations, I, we weren't really expecting people X or, you know, this actually confirmed a lot of our beliefs on how people see, see this um, opportunity. I think we learn a lot about how people think about investing generally and, and sentiment around investing. Um, so as you mentioned today, inflation is a big theme. I think people are concerned about potential returns for public equities over the next decade. Um, you know, most most private banks now I think are, are forecasting returns in, in public equities to be somewhere around five percent, uh, at least domestically. Uh, you know, people are just struggling generally with with where to put money, and I I think that maybe combined with the pandemic, maybe combined with other things, or why a lot of these alternative investing platforms are are growing so quickly now. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, 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 those are most of the conversations we have, right? Like people don't show up for calls and really know anything about the art market. So we're educating them for the first time outside of Picasso, Banksy, Basquiat, those, maybe yeah. Herring, maybe Kusama. Those are really the only artists that people have heard of. So we're, we're just doing a ton of work to train people on the art market from the ground up. This seems like a pretty uh, obvious question. I'm sure you get a lot, you know, for the most part, you guys have been, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, focused sort of contemporary, what is that post-World War II sort of marketplace? Is that evolving as you get bigger, as people are um, just consistently saying, yo, I want my Van Gogh, um, you know, is that <laughs> is that like the... What's what what's the what's the vision there? Do you think that'll expand, or how do you think about it? Is that just opportunistic? So, do you want to? Oh, okay. Well, I'll I'll take this one. But you know what we see is that the returns in the impressionist and modern segment, which is what ostensibly you know Monet, Van Gogh, uh, Picasso would fall under, they lag behind. They I would say underperform or have underperformed relative to post-war and contemporary, and we just see the interest continuing um, to probably be stronger in the later segments, because when you go to, I mean, I think maybe you experience this too, if you go to a museum, some things, you know, have a really amazing presence in a museum, but if you think about the people who are actually buying these things, these works to live with them, um, you know, there are certain artists that feel much more contemporary and as um, kind of the new generation of collectors uh starts starts and continues to buy we just see demand continuing kind of in these more recent segments um i don't know you know i can't say definitively what we're going to offer by the end of the year um but we did uh at the end of last year we did uh offer a picasso that did exceptionally well on the platform um even though you know our published returns are lower than most of our other offerings or were lower than most of our other yeah, I mean, I think the thing that's interesting about Impressionist and Modern, and I, I like to use this example with Monet, um, you know, when you think about any asset class, you think about what is what is the appreciation rate of return and what is the volatility, and therefore what is the risk adjusted return or sharp ratio from, from a, you know, technical financial perspective. And if you look at certain markets like Monet, um, his, his historical appreciation rate is 6 to 7% a year, but his volatility is incredibly low. So his risk adjusted return or sharp ratio is above one. And we think that's a really interesting segment of the art market, uh, but a lot of investors in today's world are not, not looking for a very low risk, six to 7% return, at least the ones that, that we see coming to the website. So I'd, I'd like to integrate those types of offerings in that segment of the art market 
uh, into the platform more in the future because I do think there's there's definitely product market fit for a certain type of investor, um, but we haven't you know as much said we haven't really done it so yeah. far. And it's you know you're also talking about a completely different price segment. So if you're thinking about buying, you know, like Cecily Brown, I'll use her as an example. I love her work. You know, right now her auction record is you know between six and seven million. Um, so the you know the best work you'll find by her is going to be in that price range. To buy the best Monet or the best Picasso, you're looking at a hundred million, right? So it's you know million, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll just call that we'll just, million. Yeah, we'll just call that y'all's. We'll just call that y'all Series B. <laughs> <laughs> We're just gonna fundraise for this one painting. Um, yeah. And so you know when you're also thinking about then turning around and selling that you know let's say one to two hundred million dollar painting, you know how much harder is it to find a buyer that's willing to pay two x that versus two x you know one to five million dollars. It's a completely different ball game at that point. And so, um, you know, looking at and and they're you know they're just much harder to find. You know, finding a Van Gogh right now is next to impossible. There was you know in November I think uh, we mentioned briefly that there were the big sales, but there actually was an impressionist collection that came up to market. And they were, they were all I would say pretty much a a plus examples by the various artists. And you know you had outstanding prices. And then when I looked at those prices, part of what I thought was, well, is somebody going to be able to resell kind of a tiny, you know, Monet fragment that has the state stamp on it for enough to make a profit on this in, you know, five to 10 years, I was thinking probably not. So yeah, it's a, you, a, look at yeah. you guys having price discipline here in 2022 no one's <laughs> no one has price discipline. Uh, We're you guys, seeing some crazy things at auction, but yeah. you know, we're being selective about what we go after. So I was thinking back so in, uh, into the November sales when when some of these Monets were, were selling. I can't remember the I can't remember the painting or the prices now, but tens of millions of dollars. I took this uh, this business partner to the sale, and he's like, "Oh, you know, Monets are selling for forty million dollars. That market must be on fire." But but the thing that a lot of people fail to realize is in 1980, Monets were selling for twenty million dollars. So you know, it's it's. Uh, it's one segment of the market where prices have always been been really high. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Masha, you mentioned some of the things you see uh, that are crazy, amazing, good, bad, um, just bananas. Tell us about some of those. Like, and and who who are these? Uh, just are they just price agnostic collectors? Is it groups that just get caught up in the bidding frenzy? Um, what's some of the weird, I mean, I'm sure there's a million stories about the art market. You guys can't tell, um, for various reasons, but, uh, talk to us a little bit about some of the experiences, uh, you, you have, uh, in this, um, in this world that most of us will, will never see. I mean, I think it's, you know, I think it's every season you kind of tend to forget that there is going to be another season that's probably as exciting. And so you walk out of the sale room and think, geez, I can't believe that made that much money. And then it's to me incredible that the auction houses turn around and do it again six months later um, or sometimes sooner. And so one of those moments is the Maclow collection came up for sale, um, you know, real estate uh, titan and going through a divorce. And so that collection, uh, you know, it, Sotheby's, it was well known that they put up a big guarantee. And then, you know, we're sitting in the room kind of expecting, you know, on some works that were priced very fully, expecting quiet bidding. And then you see people on the phones get into bidding wars. And so in some cases you find out who bought what. And, you know, the hard thing is obviously I can't talk about that here, but it is interesting because you see, you know, some of the wealthiest people and some of the wealthiest collectors in the world um, now really competing for pieces because of the, you know, sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's clear to me why, why they're competing and sometimes it's, not so clear because you know we internally will look at something and price something differently so it's one of those moments where you're you know like last season the sales you realize that the art market is really changing quite a bit and so um you know really just being aware of how people are buying and you know that top end of the market is much more unpredictable than when you're in the i'd say like under 20 million dollar category um i think the rothko was the first thing that came to mind was just you know we weren't expecting it for go to go for you know what was it 80 something yeah, like 80 to 90 million dollars 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's there's more billionaires now than than ever, right? And the number of new billionaires entering the art market is is arguably at a, at a faster pace than than we've seen. So it it, um, it is unpredictable, and I, I think it's even more unpredictable when you when you have new, very wealthy people entering the art market that haven't collected before. Mm -hmm. It's hard to sort of figure out what will they collect, how you know how they're collecting, collecting patterns change, and that's that's what the auction houses and you know dealers really focus on. Yeah. yeah, I remember talking to a collector. Um, one of my favorites is he's a he's a coin coin guy, and he said, you know, um, one of the things when I look to the future is is thinking, um, and this is generational trends. But you know, what did that generation when they were younger covet when they didn't have any money? As they come into money, what will those preferences then play out in the real world? Um, you know, and each one has its different, you know, different expressions, of course. And um, that's probably an easy task to, to brainstorm about, but, but harder to actually make it an investment thesis around. I think the example of that in the art market is Banksy, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like, a, like I learned about Banksy in high school and then in college, one of my, you know, very well-respected professors discussed Banksy, but at the time the art market wasn't, wasn't taking him seriously. You could get a Banksy for under $5,000 easy, but there were these pockets of big collectors, especially, you know, who really just liked his aesthetic and, you know, bought dozens of his works. And now he's, you know, he's almost like this like I would say it's like the closest thing to like an artist folk hero people have, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. He's like, a, he has a message that's, you know, fundamentally speaks to um, a large population. And he's, he has this visual language that he's developed that can cut across languages and really be understood uh, by a lot of people. So we do see a lot of people who got well, you know, who uh, grew into their wealth through, you know, also some, you know, I would say non-traditional means. So for example, like crypto and, you know, that, and so they actually, you can, you can understand why collecting Banksy and going after Banksy resonates kind of in a way that it wouldn't with your very traditional collector who, you know, grew up learning what art is by going to the MoMA versus kind of these more underground um, organic events. Um. As you guys look around the space, what are um, and I, I don't want you to telegraph your intentions as the as the axe now, but you know, are there certain areas you guys look at and you're like, you know what, I don't think investors are really appreciating, you know, this certain class of artists or um, styles, or maybe um, you know we think they have sort of, you know, this is the small cap value of, uh, and I was smiling, Scott, earlier as you were talking about the projections, because I consistently get, uh, this past weekend, get get ratioed and, and dunked on on Twitter, because I, I think market cap US is straight up a, a donut or a bagel for real returns for the next decade, so 0% returns. Um, but that nominal would be maybe three or four, but, um, so, um, but there's pockets of opportunity everywhere. There usually is, you know, these things go through cycles. Are there any areas you guys are particularly uh, either personally or, you know, firm wide, um, you know, excited, bullish on, hope to acquire that you haven't? Anything, yeah, you know, anywhere the, you want to take it? Well, the one, the one thing we always talk about a lot is our sort of abstract painters on the platform and just, just lack of uh, receptivity investors have to... It's, you know, it's one of the things that people talk about, you know, we've, we've been discussing works that can be sold via, via PDF. Now there is a whole class of works that cannot be sold via PDF and minimalism and definitely falls into that category. And so, you know, that's something where you see it on a screen and it doesn't have an effect on you because the whole point is standing in front of it and sitting with it for a while and seeing it in its intended place. So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. If you if you look at the whole portfolio, the whole portfolio net of fees is performed um, at about fifteen and a half percent on an annualized basis. And you look at artists like like uh, Richter, um, who's purely an abstract painter. Uh, Agnes Martin, who's a minimalist mm -hmm. painter. Uh, those have been some of our best offerings from a performance perspective. But I think a lot of retail investors look at these paintings, and you know, it's, it kind of falls into that. I, I feel like my kids could do that category. <laughs> And uh, they they wind up you know they wind up not investing but th those have been some of our 
our best performing artists. Yeah, you know, it, 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 it's, um, it's gonna be fun to watch you guys, uh, you know, in the coming years, um, you know, some of the areas uh, as we look out into the time, uh, horizon 2023, it's hard to say, geez, 2025 <laughs> for Masterworks. <laughs> What, what are you guys noodling on other than uh, other than our uh, Soho party Masterworks meetup come springtime in New York? I haven't been to New York in like two years. It's yeah, you gotta, uh, it's you really gotta, you got to come visit us. Since it's you're killing me. Talking about farmland all the time. Mm -hmm. Am I guessing you're in the Midwest <laughs> or Texas? No, I'm in Los Angeles. But we, oh. you know, we. Uh, <laughs> Wait, you said that earlier. Okay. We talk about a lot about investing opportunities in areas that. Um, you know, historically have been uh, not available to most investors. And while totally different, farmland and art are two categories that historically had great returns. Um, you know, we had um, uh, a professor on this podcast who did a great paper on, in your world, Professor Dimson, um, you know, of, of uh, Marsh Staunton. They wrote my favorite investing book, Triumph of the Optimist, but they had a good paper on uh, certain collectibles are being one of them, but, um, but farmland, my family comes from, uh, the Midwest. So Kansas, Nebraska, and, uh, it's a phenomenal asset class, but hard to access to. So similar opportunity. And it's funny. Cause when I, I told, I think I told Scott this, when we first chatted, um, when I saw a lot of these platforms, including masterworks, I said, cool idea way too ambitious. This is going to be so hard. You're going to have to have thousands of phone calls with investors and that's just not going to work. <laughs> so <laughs> kudos guys. Um, you know, it's def definitely, <laughs> definitely so very hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. It's look, great so, to see. When we, so when we, when we think about growth in 2022, there's really two things we think about. One is what type of investment products can we offer? Right. So today that's really these single asset vehicles where people are picking and choosing which painting to invest in. Uh, we want to we want to roll out a fun product, which we're very close to doing now. So people can just get broad beta like exposure and everything on the on the Masterworks platform. Um, and the second thing is distribution. So I think we're we're very unique in that whether you're a large endowment like Harvard or whether you're a tiny investor investing twenty dollars in every every offering that we launch. There's no way to really get exposure to art today outside of buying a painting or working with us. So we, we want to offer products to all different types of investors across wealth advisory and into to institutions um, as we move forward. And those are obviously longer sales cycles, um, but we, we have lots of demand really across all, all investor types. Yeah. So if you got one of the institutions that's listening to this and they say, um, hey, Scott, uh, can you do like a white label being the wrong word, but can you just act as my um, I like Masha. I, I want her to be my uh, be my rep. Can I can I just give you a hundred million bucks and you guys build me a portfolio? Is that something you guys would be open to or is it just not really mission uh, fit in the brand right now or what story? Yeah, I mean, that specifically doesn't fit the brand, but we have talked to um, to people about fund structures where we, we do um, custom portfolio construction by having the fund by certain paintings uh, that we launch on the platform, right? So if someone wants a certain portfolio to meet, you know, a certain appreciation rate, volatility criteria, we can theoretically construct that by, by having the fund just buy certain securities on the platform. So we have, um, we have, we have had conversations like that, but that, that, that's really about it so far. Yeah. Um, one of the things we haven't talked that much about is, you know, and we talk a lot about this investing. Um, we talked a lot about the buy, you know, what paintings do you buy? What are the opportunities? How to use data to inform that decision? How do you work with all the, the weird, uh, wonderful, eccentric personalities in the art world? But that's only half of the decision. The other half is when do you let it go, if ever? Talk to us a little bit about how you sell. Um, what is the general process? Uh, is it traditionally through auction? Is it someone just ringing you up and saying, yo, guys, got a buyer. It's a Russian oligarch. He wants this one. Um, What's the traditional time frame that you know these these uh, you hold these and everything wrapped up in it? Yeah, so the the art market tends to be very event driven. Um, so the right time to sell paintings are usually when you're when you we, when you have momentum behind 
an artist setting a price record, a retrospective of an institution, um, something that's that's driving a lot of interest in that that artist market. Uh, for the paintings that we have sold, it's it's been people who have just come to us unexpectedly and, and made offers to 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 buy certain works at prices that we think are are fair. Um, so it, you know that that's that certainly happened. But I think we we tell people to think of these as three to ten year illiquid holds. We're three years into the portfolio now. So we're just starting to see more more paintings sell, but you know, should expect a lot a lot more to sell over the coming the coming years. Well, the nice part now is you're going to start to have the rolling vintages, right? Where you have stuff that's brand new to the stuff you've held for years of various artists. So it's kind of like a a private equity portfolio that uh, you know has sort of a indefinite um, rolling rolling future, which is cool. Um, yeah. And we are also focused more. I mean, one of the one of the top priorities this year is to focus more on on the secondary market to actually get market makers into these securities, build out more liquidity, um, so investors can get out in hours rather than than days, which is is kind of the typical um, transaction time now in the secondary market. So I think I think that's another key feature that's really interesting, right? Like if you if you can build out liquidity in these assets then the, the need of actually selling them declines over time. Good, you're gonna, you're gonna see, uh, what should my, um, do, you guys, do you guys have to have a name on it? I was gonna say Manhattan Beach Surfer put in a bunch of cheap bids on all these uh, floors, <laughs> on all these markets waiting to get, uh, people when they get upside down on their mortgage, they have to go sell their paintings to me. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's how I'm gonna acquire my portfolio, $20 at a time. I, um, I, I imagine you'll be very happy with that. <laughs> yeah. We we didn't we're never gonna have a bear market in stocks again. I don't know. It's been a long uh, long time since we had a big fat one, but um, they you know they're normal. They come and go. Um, what else, guys? What what do we uh, what do we not talked about today that's been on your brain? Anything you're worried about? Excited about? Any government influences? Anything going on in the geopolitical world uh, that you, know, you think is curious? Well, yeah, I, I think the one thing that is I, I was I was uh, kind of over holiday reading just um, recaps of 2021. And I think the thing that was really interesting was how China continued to be a big player in the art market, despite the public markets in China, right? Like I think in public equities in China were down 25% roughly um, last year. So it, it that was that was pretty surprising. Like I would have expected China to be, to be more quiet, but I guess just, you know, this dynamic again of the top 1% or Chinese billionaires are very different than how, um, the public markets are behaving, behaving in that country. So um, I think that was what, a good what, sign, but it, yeah, it doesn't, what, what, doesn't really seem like anything is causing art prices to slow yeah. anytime soon. But it, but like you said, I mean, you can almost say that about know. every, yeah. every other asset class. Yeah. Has, um, have there been any areas where, I mean, like I, I imagine this comes in waves, like, so you see people, you know, have certain runs wealthy in China. I mean, the U S it's certainly still stock markets at all time highs. Uh, the crypto community, uh, you know, has has had a huge inflow of wealth. Although they may seem to be targeting that at NFTs, I have no idea. Um, but uh, but you you typically have these sort of you know peaks and valleys of investor groups. Um, is this still mostly American dominated Europe, or is no, it kind of I mean, the, everything? The most it's it's very roughly I think a, qu a quarter of the U.S., a quarter of China, a quarter of Western Europe, and a quarter of rest of the world, um, you know, give or take over the last several years. So there isn't really any particular country outside of the U.S. and China that have a major influence on the art market. Yeah, and it's also kind of funny to think about kind of some of the people who buy the works that are you know twenty million dollar plus. They probably have a home in every place that you've just mentioned, yeah. um, and their collections kind of go also around the world so yeah yeah i think that's right i mean we, we are seeing more demand in asia to buy western art so we we do see more more western art being being sold into asia but um yeah, yeah definitely. all right masha who's an artist that you haven't acquired that's on your to-do list you can name a couple so that you're not just telegraphing <laughs> to the world that master um, is going to no, let's, let's buy i know i'm the, like anyone yeah. scott doesn't want me to do this i think you we can give a category the, I think we want to keep <laughs> the element of surprise alive for when they yeah. appear on our platform but i will give you a hot tip in february if you're looking to kind of learn more about art and experience an art fair freeze los angeles is taking place in february so 
think what, it's February 17th. What's it called? Freeze, F-R-I-E-Z-E. -E. So that's another thing is that, you know, as things are kind of sort of open, uh, open, but wear a mask kind of, uh, the art fairs are still, you know, ostensibly happening. And so it's actually nice to go get out there and see a bunch of art um, you know, in one day versus having to, you know, travel all over the all over the city or this is officially like the only few days I go, I'm going anywhere in the next quarter was uh it was supposed to be in Miami the week prior but that conference just got canceled so I was hopping over to to see some uh friends who have decamped to Puerto Rico and it is literally during that week uh so we'll see I, that may get canceled too who knows um well my my favorite museum that I went to in the past six months was uh, the Crystal Bridges in Arkansas uh, was down there. I and been, have you been? I, I, I haven't, been I haven't actually been. That's but high, I mean, high on my to-do list. Yeah, well, I, been a big, I had no uh, expectations. And we were at this acre trader, had a, a farming conference and was down there. And, um, you know, I, I couldn't even find Bentonville on a map before that, but was so pleasantly surprised at what an yeah, awesome museum and if you like mountain biking listeners that's like uh you know world-class spot so um well freeze we'll see I, I may send some uh send some friends and see if they can uh take some notes for me but it's a place to go cool um any other big events coming up elsewhere in the world or like are they uh new york you said it's springtime mostly yeah so so the you know we like to just come january start calendaring out the year so uh, freeze is the first bigger art fair and that's happening in February and then first week of March that's when you kick off the uh, first round of auctions with London and it's always I think people get a little bit little bit jittery for the first one of the season to see how it goes and whether or not you have active bidding or tepid bit bidding um, I think all the indicators point to active as of now and so then you know once once March 1st hits we'll be off to the races. Yeah, and the one, the one thing you can do, which I think a lot of people don't actually uh, know this, is you, you can actually just go to Sotheby's or Christie's website during auction season and watch the auctions live. And if you've never done it before, it's cool to see, I don't know, half billion, billion dollars yeah. of art sell so that a single, single evening. So that crazy sale that I mentioned where you're just sitting watching the kind of bids ping pong between two specialists, you could have just, you know, been on your in the comfort of your own home on your couch watching that it gives me too much anxiety the only auction i've ever been to was was in i was like in my late 20s palm springs there was a camaro that i wanted to buy i think god i didn't buy it what a nightmare this would have been uh, it was like a <laughs> late 60s burgundy gorgeous camaro and i went there had a number in mind and it sold for less than number i was just too like it like the whole thing was like caused me too much uh, panic. Uh, so I, I didn't buy happy. I didn't buy it, but, um, at the time was, was quite sad about the whole process, but a fun, it was very much like a circus like atmosphere with all those beautiful cars. But, uh, yeah, I would love to go and just stress myself out watching, uh, watching Masha. Just don't, just don't register for a paddle or like, don't raise your hand right. or like scratch right. your head <laughs> and you'll you be go. fine. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, no, I've seen like, I think everyone else on the planet, you know, the famous uh, shredding video and some of these others have been, uh, been fun yeah. to watch. And that, uh, that resold. Uh, world record, a uh, rumor has it that it's going to a museum in China and that, you know, that painting that sold for what was it, two, three million? I can't remember what it was. And went for 30 and is the, now the new auction record. So lesson yeah, so learned. It was so it was, it was crazy that the person bought it for whatever, I can't remember, three million, but yeah. it's even crazier that it's now now considered this important culturally significant yeah. object. But but also, you know, it's funny because just circling back to the Dow aspect, I knew somebody who was bidding on behalf of a Dow. Like it's right. like it's this mm. really unpredictable dynamic where it's, you know, po pooled capital in a way, you know, in a way Masterworks is pooled capital. You also have pooled capital coming in from other angles. And that's the Banksy market is just one of a kind. Yeah. Interesting. Are there any other weird outliers like that? Is like, is he the one? I mean, he's got a ton of name recognition, particularly for the younger crowd. But are there any that um, that have that sort of uh, uh, characteristics around it? Mm. Not really. Yeah, right? I mean, every every artist market has different different characteristics that really drive demand. I think with a different type of of collector base um, by market, but but that's. That's been the most unexpected one. I, you know, it's funny. Like even when you looked at the um, the Banksy that that I mentioned, which sold out in a couple hours, the historical appreciation rate that we calculated on that work was like 
Yeah, the price appreciation of like 12 to 13%. 12, yeah, 12 to 13%. So, but you know, in the past 12 months, we've seen this huge explosion. So when we when we calculated over the last several years, it's it's low. Um, yeah. yeah, it's just, it's, you know, some, and again, this just speaks to the fact that each artist has a standalone market, right? And so you can't lump everything into this post-war contemporary because each artist within that, you have to look at their markets and their body of work independently. Yeah, yeah. Guys, this has been a whirlwind tour. Um, we should be doing this every six months, I imagine, uh, hear what uh, is going on in your world. Um, any final thoughts? Uh, any uh, any good, um, obviously, where do we go? Masterworks, is it still masterworks.io? Yeah, masterworks.io can, um... Uh, create an account, schedule a call with our membership team. They'll walk you through suitability, how you're investing today, what your risk tolerance is, make recommendations around total allocation for a portfolio, and then and then specific offerings. Listeners, if you use code MEB, you get something. I can't remember what it was, but I think the, the <laughs> thing was is that it, it directs your onboarding call direct to Scott. It skips the, uh, you get to talk to him to onboard you. So go straight to his cell phone. Let's get a, <laughs> let's get a few uh, tens of thousands of listeners to, uh, to get Scott's cell phone numbers. So you guys use code MEB, whatever you do when you sign up. Um, Y'all, this has been a blast. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Thanks, man. Thanks. <laughs>